Hello and welcome to the session on using the Object Document Mapper Mongo Engine. So we're going to look at using Mongo Engine for MongoDB for the CRUD functions, create, read, update and delete, as well as using Flask Mongo Engine uh, pagination instead of creating our own. And we're going to do this creating a simple book database. So who am I? My name is Nisha Gaffney, known as Gaff. I am a Code Institute Diploma and Full Stack Development student since February of this year. I've recently submitted my Milestone 3 project. And this is a subset of some of the functions that I use for that project, uh, specifically around Object Document Mapper Mongo Engine. I've been in IT since, and the business of IT since 1986, unemployed since June of 2018. And I'm hoping that with the this diploma and the knowledge and skills gained through this course, that I will be able to get a job as a developer. I'm married to Fiona. Uh, we were married 10 years. I grew up in Stockholm, Sweden, lived there for 36 years. And I lived in Ireland for 12 years. Um, Though I, I have been in Ireland before when I was I was actually uh, lived there a couple of years before, but this is now my home. I have dual citizenship, Swedish and Irish, and that's it in a nutshell. So the object document mapper then Mongo engine. We're going to have a look right now at the overview. We're going to use a book object document mapper example. We're going to do the initial setup, create a minimal viable Flask application to create the continuous development deployment workflow. Then we're going to look at the MongoDB, uh, the database itself, and Flask Mongo Engine and the Mongo Engine extensions. Then the book class, so the fields, how to define the fields, uh, certain parameters we can provide in terms of default values and so on. Followed by number four, which is kind of the meat of this application, creating the Flask templates and the CRUD functions. And rather than just talking about the, or showing you the CRUD functions in Python, I think it's more important to be able to create a, an application that we can see the front end interact with the back end. So we see the, the whole the whole solution. Then we're doing, just looking at something extra called the Flask Debug Toolbar, which is a Flask extension, which helped me uh, resolve three bugs I had. I solved two and managed to implement a workaround for the third one. And Flask Debug Toolbar not only helped me do that, but it also helped me better understand how the Flask micro framework uh, works. So also, I think, to my mind, helped me write better code. We'll look at that. Then we are going to improve our uh, application created there on the number four uh, with by adding pagination, which is number six, using Flask Mongo Engine. And then we're going to take a more advanced step by creating a search function with pagination and using the session cookie to store the uh, search criteria. So the outcome of this is, I think you will realize just how easy it is to use Mongo Engine, see the benefits of using Mongo Engine as opposed to using PyMongo directly. And you will gain an understanding of the object document mapper Flask Mongo Engine and Mongo Engine using the CRUD function. So create, read, update, delete. You can either use that for your milestone three project or uh, more likely when you're on the job. We will also expand upon that by looking at pagination, Flask debug toolbar, and session cookies, as well as configuring a full continuous development deployment workflow. Now there are certain assumptions. I am working on the assumption that you already have some experience with GitHub, Visual Studio Code and Roku, as well as a foundation in the Flask micro framework and templates. Now, if you don't, don't worry, you can follow along anyway. And I think that you can still use these when you get to your, uh, get to the stage that you're ready to do your, your own Milestone 3 project. So this is the information architecture a navigation of the application we are going to create. We have a landing page, we have, can add a book, we can delete a book, we can edit a book, and we can search books with a search results page. So these are screenshots then from the application. The landing page, where we are reading the books from the database, the R in CRUD, uh, the form to add a book, in other words, the C in CRUD, 
we can delete a book, the D in CRUD. We can edit or update a book, the U in CRUD, and then the addition of a search, uh, a search form. So we can search for um, words in a title and words in an author and a rating above a certain number. And then obviously look at the results. So let's have a look at the application that we will end up with. So here we are with, if I just click on home, the landing page where we have a navigation bar. So home, add book, search book. We have a fixed footer, which does nothing for us at the moment. And we then have the, uh, in this case, the R and CRUD. In other words, we're reading these books from the store in the database. What we also have is this piece here, which is a pagination function. So for example, in page one now, I can click on page six and it takes us to page six. Uh, I can use these buttons here to go to previous or do next. And we also see here is that there's an ellipsis function. In other words, let's say we have thousands of books. That would mean literally hundreds of pages. Now we don't want <laughs> a link for each one of those hundreds of pages uh, going across the screen. That wouldn't be practical, definitely not on a smaller screen. So the ellipsis function helps us do that. We have add book. So I can fill in this form, test uh, myself, published in 2020, just a bogus ISBN, a decent book, do add book. There we go, the book was added. And to prove that that's the case, there we go. There we have the book. We can update the book. So I just go to test two, update book. And the book was updated. Test two is here. We can delete the book. It's gone. And we can search books, which is an additional feature. So I can search, let's say, uh, for anything that has test in its title. Uh, here we go. We're something, uh, let's say, something that has a title or art in its title and an author called Sun. There we go, The Art of War, Sun Tzu. Or if we just leave it empty, we get all the books that are in the repository. except those books that are hidden. And I exp uh, we'll go through that later on. So this is the application that we will end up with that has the create, in other words, add book, um, read, which is what we're doing now, viewing the books, you update, uh, in other words, update uh, a book, so title, author, and so on, and also to delete a book. And that's what these icons are here for. So the dustbin or, or rubbish bin is to delete a book and the pen is to edit or update a book. So this is it in a nutshell. To create this application then, um, we're gonna to have to do an initial setup, minimum, create a minimum viable Flask application, and then configure our continuous development deployment uh, environment using GitHub, Visual Studio Code, and Heroku. I'm gonna actually go to another slide to show you what that looks like. Um, here we have GitHub, Visual Studio Code, and Heroku. So we will use the Code Institute's full template, create a new repository. We will have then by default the master branch, but I want to use a development branch as well where I can fail fast and funky because I want to keep the master branch clean, and make sure that the only code that goes there is code that hopefully is well tested and, and works as it should, bug free. And then I will clone that repository in Visual Studio Code locally on my machine, create my Python virtual environment, install the relevant uh, so Flask framework and additional components that I need, uh, configure or create the requirements of text and proc file for Heroku, add the code for the minimal viable Flask, push that to my GitHub uh, public, or sorry, GitHub development branch, do a, I could merge it, do it by pull merge, and then I want to set up the Heroku pipeline. So the Heroku pipeline will then have a Heroku review application that will be linked to my development branch to do tests. Uh, my Heroku staging application that will be linked to my master branch and also a Heroku production application. 
On top of this, we will have four, or I at least will have four separate database instances. One for my local development environment, one for Heroku review application, one for Heroku staging application, and the final one for Heroku production. And that's because I want to make sure that I keep them separate. So when I'm testing something locally, I'm using a separate database instance, as opposed to when, I'm, when someone else is testing it on Heroku review application. And that's because I want to make sure that each test is done properly, properly with a clean environment. What that looks like then, just in the summary, I have a local environment with its own database instance, with the templates of the HTML, the CS at the front end, Python, the Floss Micro Framework, my local environment. I then push that to my GitHub development branch. And then when I'm happy with what I've pushed, I will then do a merge pull request that will create the Heroku review application with the stack application stack and its own database instance. The tests will be run to test, make sure the new functionality works. Commit the merge, it, it will destroy the Heroku review application. Merge my GitHub development code with the GitHub master code and push that to the Heroku staging application. Where after I've done a number of functions, I can then, or push number of functions, I can then do a proper integration and system test. Before finally, after all that works, pop or migrate that then to, um, or promote it to the Heroku applica uh, production application, okay? Viewing this in a slightly different way. Um, locally, I work on my GitHub developer branch. I do the local QA testing, make sure it's working. I push it to my GitHub development branch. Once I'm happy with a number of these changes, I can then initiate a, a merge pull request, which will create the Heroku review application. So I can run those tests on the Heroku platform. When I'm happy, I commit the merge that will commit my code or merge my code with the master branch that will then automatically deploy the Heroku staging application. So that let's say I've created all the various functions, create, read, update, delete. I've tested them separately in the Heroku review application, but I want to do a full integration system test and staging before promoting it then to the Heroku production application. And then we start all over again. So this is the, the development and test cycle. This is just a review of the steps uh, for the continuous development deployment uh, workflow. I will show you what I do in real life. I think it's better. So let's have a look then at setting this up. First of all, we go to GitHub. I go to new. I want to use the GitHub Git pod full template. I want to create something called book ODM. So a sample book database using the object document mapper Mongo engine for MongoDB and then create repository. So that is now happening in the, get that sorted. There we go. Now by default, we obviously have the master branch. Now I want to keep this branch as clean as possible because that will be linked to my Heroku staging application. I would rather create a separate development branch. So I'll call it development and I press return. So there we go. I now have two branches, development and master. I could create a branch for each function, a uh, create branch, a read branch, a, an update branch and a delete branch if I wanted to and you create each separate function within those branches before submitting those to, um, uh, sorry, before merging those with GitHub master. Okay, so let's see then. Now, what I want to do is I obviously want to you or use Visual Studio Code. In Visual Studio Code, I go to Files and I say Clone Repository. I want to clone it from my GitHub. And there we have Book ODM. Now I 
store obviously this is where I store files locally I store mine on uh, Dropbox but you can store yours wherever you want repository and select location would you like to open the clone repository yes I do let's close that so here we go I have the repository now by default then I'm using the master branch I want, don't want to do that I want to keep my master branch clean so I click on that and I choose my development branch as you can see there we go now the next step then is to open the terminal and then we're in the right directory so here I do python 3 minus m v e n v so this is say I'm telling uh, so I'm using python 3 I want to make sure we're using Python 3, not Python 2. Minus M, V, and we create a Python virtual environment. I want to call mine dot V, E, N, V. You can call yours kebab, hamburger, whiskey, peach, cream, I don't know, doesn't matter. I like to use dot V, E, N, V. Okay, so I'm just going to close the window. Now then, as you can see though, uh, 452 files. I do not want to push my virtual environment to GitHub. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update the .gitignore file with .venv. I just save that. And we should see then that it should react and say there's only one file to upload. There we go. One. Now I also want to add a dot env. So that's going to be the name of my um, my variables file. And I obviously don't want that to be up uploaded to GitHub because that will contain the URI to my to the MongoDB instance. That will contain uh, my password in clear text. So I do definitely don't want that up there. What I also want to do here is uh, let's just create a new file, call it app.py. So there we go. And by default, then let's just close that down. It now uses the global uh, Python environment, but I want to use the virtual environment that we just created. So I will click on that and I want to use that environment there dot v e n v and there it's changed uh yes i'm going to install the linter and you can see then it's actually activated that environment because i have the within parentheses dot v e n v uh, i'm going to just do a pip install pip minus minus upgrade just update that and then I want to install flask so pip install flask with a capital F and it obviously adds a few additional components flask ginger markup safe work so click and it's dangerous and then I want to use a green unicorn web server gateway interface instead of the flask default web server gateway interface so we do a pip install gunicorn and then because of the way I load my environment file I also need pip install python dash dot env there we go and because I prepared this and this is going to take a while I'm going to copy the minimum viable flask code in here uh, do I install out a pep yes I do now <clears throat> so just to what this does then is let's save this here 
we import the OS and the reason is that I want to use that for um, loading uh, my variables uh, from Flask import Flask and then import Gunicorn because I want to use a green unicorn web server gateway interface now you may have a different way of, of loading your uh, environment variables this is the way I do it so that's why I installed python-env to be able to do that to load my .env file um, to instantiate the application we have app equals flask now <clears throat> um, underscore underscore name underscore underscore I know that the default for static folder is static and I know that the template folder by default is called templates this is what I call a paranoia setting it's just for me to make sure that that's set the way it should be we have our a default route which basically returns this is the minimum viable flask application with a few extras and then what I do is in my dot environment file which I will upload soon I have a an environment variable called app debug so by default all my applications are running with debug equals false unless I have the environment variable app debug equals on and that's just me to make it's just for me to make sure that I won't run my applications in debug mode on the Heroku, Heroku production platform by mistake. So just make sure this works. I will click on this icon here and there we go. I can click on that and then the application works. This is the minimum viable Flask application with a few extras, which is good. So we now know the application works. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop that. Okay. Now, for the continuous development deployment framework, I need to, before deploying to Heroku, I need to add a couple additional files. So we're going to start off by creating the initial requirements.txt file. So we have pip, freeze, and pipe to requirements.txt. And there we go. If we look at the file, we have, so we have flask. Uh, we have It's Dangerous, Gunicorn, Ginger 2, and so on. So that's good. What I also want to do is I want to create my proc file. So what I'm going to do is, now we can do it command line or I can do it here. I'm just going to do click file, new file, called proc file, turn, and what I want to add to that is So web colon gunicorn because that's the web server gateway interface I'm going to use. And app app. Save that. I could have done this from the command line, uh, which I think some of us are used to, but just saying echo web sorry web colon gunny corn space app colon app uh, however I decided just to do it directly in here so we go what I'm also going to do is <clears throat> which is not really necessary but it's an another one of these paranoia settings that I like to use and I like to use a runtime.txt file so I'm just going to copy that from and just paste it in here. So I'll copy that, I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to copy that. So basically, now I'm just going to paste this into uh, there, those files. So what I've done is so runtime.txt has the runtime, the Python runtime that I want Heroku to use when executing my application. And the reason I'm doing this is that when I was doing my Milestone 3 project, I hadn't defined this, and it was using an older version of the Python runtime, 
which had a uh, security uh, issue. And then to force it then to use this new version, I had to create this file. The other file on here, .slug git ignore. So we use .git ignore, for example, to make sure that we don't push files from our local machine to our to GitHub. Now .slug ignore .slug ignore, sorry, it does something similar, but basically what it says is it don't push these files from GitHub to Heroku uh, platform. And we're going to see why, because I'm going to name some of these files that I don't want to upload. Now, the, what we would potentially use this for would be when we're creating documentation and we have a documentation directory. We may not want all the documentation or all the screenshots and everything else to be uploaded to, um, uh, to Heroku. So when I was doing a Milestone 3 project, um my application was something like 50.7 megabytes however with all the documentation it was over, well over 300 megabytes um, which was just unnecessary and what happens is heroku will gently just say there's a soft limit of 300 megabytes which is it's just a warning however there is a hard limit of 500 megabytes so it's just a way of making sure that we don't upload files we don't need okay now, I'm not going to show you my <laughs> .env file, but it contains my URI uh, and my secret key. And obviously, I don't want to share those with a wider audience. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to push these. Now, Many of you probably know how to use uh, command line utilities. However, I like using Visual Studio Code. So I will just say initial commit of minimum, sorry, minimum viable Flask application. And I will then go to there. I will stage all changes. I will commit all. So this is similar to doing a git add, git commit, and then I will push them. However, I like using the, the, the user interface instead. Now I have documented the command lines uh, for those of you that prefer to use command, command line utilities. What this means though, is if we have a look now, we should, if I refresh this, see that, yeah, so it's updated the uploaded uh, .slug ignore. Um, it has uploaded, sorry, I'm just gonna go to development again. Um, the app.py, proc file, requires a text, and run ton of text to my GitHub development branch. When we look at my master branch, we can see that nothing, okay? Nothing's changed. That's because I haven't merged my GitHub development branch changes to my GitHub master yet. Before I do that, what I want to do is I want to go to Heroku to set up the pipeline. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do create new pipeline, not create new app, create new pipeline. And I'm going to call this book dash ODM. Uh, that's fine. And I want to link this to a book ODM on GitHub. Okay. So I've now linked my pay pipeline, sorry, to my GitHub book ODM repository, create pipeline. So what it does then is I have enabled review applications, staging, and production. First of all, I'm going to enable review applications. And what I can do here is create new review apps for a new pull request automatically. In other words, whenever I create a new pull request saying that I want to merge my development branch or whatever branch I'm using to the master branch, please create a Heroku review application based on that development branch. So I want to do that. Thank you very much. I want to destroy stale and other applications that haven't been destroyed automatically. 
after two days. And since I'm in Europe, I want to use Europe. Enable review applications. There we go. And I also want to add an application for staging. I want to call it book-odm-staging. So I know when I'm working on it that this is a staging application. It's not available. Okay. Uh, that's probably because, so let's do this. Let's call it book ODM stag. Europe, create application. That's interesting. I then want to create a production application. I will call that book dash ODM dash prod. Create new app. That's fine. I want to store in Europe and I want to create app. I'm just going to refresh the dashboard because it shouldn't look like that. There we go. So I now have my review apps, staging and production. However, I need to configure these with the correct environment variables. And we will do that in, in a second. I need to add the secret key and I need to add the MongoDB URI that I want to use for each one of these. But we, <clears throat> we will do that actually. So I will just show you. Under Heroic Review Apps, I click on Configure, click on More Settings, and then I go down to Reveal Config Variables. And then here, I have my secret key. Now, obviously, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to add, so this is not secret. I add. I also have uh, a URI uh, that I use. Now, obviously, what I'm going to call it in my code is Mongo URI book ODM and I will change this value uh, a little later on. But I need to do that for all three environments. So this is the Heroku review application. I need to then go back to my uh, book ODM. Now, why do I have two? Sorry, this it shouldn't be this way. <clears throat> I then go to my staging application and I go to settings and I do same thing here my secret key now I'm going to change these in a different window but just for the sake of making sure that you understand what I'm doing okay what I also want to do here is I want to connect my staging application. It's connected to GitHub, but I want to connect it to my master branch and I want to enable automatic deploys. In other words, whenever new code is merged to my GitHub master branch, I want that to be deployed automatically to Heroku staging. So I enable automatic deploys under deploy, that's it. Let's go back to that, um, to my pipeline. I then did the same with my application, settings, configurations, secret key. And then Sorry, Mongo U R I underscore book ODM. Now obviously you can call <clears throat> call yours whatever you want. So what I've done then is if we go back, I have a pipeline uh, called book ODM. It has Heroku review applications with the configuration variables for my Mongo URI and also for my secret key. I have a Heroku staging application with the <coughs> Uh, automatic deployment from GitHub master to Heroku staging and also the same configuration um, variables, my secret key and <clears throat> the Mongo 
DBURI. Now these are going to be different though. So I'm going to have a different uh, secret key, a Mongo DBURI from a Heroku review application, a different one for staging, and the same for production. <coughs> Sorry. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, in a different window uh, that you can't see, I'm going to make the uh, relevant configurations off camera. So just bear with me. So I'm just going to put the proper, uh, let's see. So just removing a few things here as well. So what I'm doing, but I can't show you this, of course, is I'm going to just enter my proper secret key under uh, each variable and the proper URI as well for the DB for the database. So I'm just now adding my uh, individual um, secret keys to each one of the applications. And then <clears throat> I'm just gonna add a unique URI per for each database instance. Now I will share these with you in a moment. So what I'm doing now is just updating the MongoDB URI for each application, the Heroku review application, the staging application, the production application, and they each have their unique MongoDB instance with a unique name. And I'll show what they are in a sec. <coughs> Okay, 
So you can see that something has happened <laughs> as I'm updating them, but I, I obviously don't want to share the my secret key or my passwords with anyone. Okay. Perfect. Now, I'm just going to make a final change, but I don't want that to be seen there. So let's open up that. Just bear with me a sec. Okay, there we go. So what this means is on what we've done so far, just to recap, is configured the four environments. Each one has a database instance and I haven't created the databases. I haven't, all I've done now is I've defined the MongoDB URI for each instance one called dev, one called rev, one called stage, and one called production. I've made sure that I've added a secret key, one for my local environment in my .env file, one for Heroku review application in, in configuration, uh, or sorry, under settings, the same for staging, and the same for production. So that's what we've done so far. Now, <clears throat> Okay, what I'd like to do now, so I've pushed this to my GitHub development branch, but I want to um, merge this with uh, my master branch, because I can see I've, I've run this locally, it works. What I do is I have an extension, and I shall show you how to get that extension. It is there. For VS Code, there's something called GitHub Pull Request and Issues extension. Installing that gives us the menu here, this menu here. So I can add issues and I can add pull requests. I can see which pull requests I've created, but also which pull requests my team members have created. So let's go to um, there, see the plus, click on that. I want the target branch to be master, yes, for that repository. I want to use my commit message, yes. And what it does now is it will create, open this form, and it will then allow me to do a merge pull request. Now, what happens is, if we look at Roku, you see it's actually creating my Roku review application. So let's check the log. Here we go, um, installing Python, looking at the requirements text file, downloading, installing relevant extensions, using the uh, pertinent proc file, and soon it should be done. What it does is, well, it creates a unique and dynamic URL. So for every time, every new Heroku review application will have its own new URL. What I do before I open the application is I want to have a look at the log just to make sure that there are no issues. So state change from starting it up. Okay, that looks good. So if we click on the application, we see it's working. This is the minimum viable Flask application with a few extras. And you can see the URL there with the LDL, VO, whatever is, um, is unique. Okay, let's go back to uh, the pipeline. So this is automatic, automatically created based upon the code in my GitHub development branch. Now, in my pull request here, what I could say then is something intelligent. Well, <laughs> uh, build and 
build, run, and test successful. Build, run, and test successful. Okay. Because I am the only person in the repository, I can do a merge pull request and commit that. However, what would, if I was working in a team, I would not be able to do that. Someone else would have to test the application and approve my code. But I can just do, let's just add that comment. Let's merge pull request. Let's create the merge commit. So what happens is I could delete the branch, but I don't want to because I'm going to continue working on my development branch. Let's close that down and let's have a look what happens on a Roku. Let's just refresh that. So it has destroyed the Heroku review application because we've already done that unit testing, we're happy. And it has now merged the GitHub development branch code with the GitHub master code and auto deployed it to Heroku staging. So the first time there we see it is using the right Python version, requires a text file, the right proc file, yep. And it will soon be done. There we go. Perfect. And again, I want to just make sure that all is well. So I check the logs. Build stage and change starting up, build succeeded. Okay, that looks good. Open application. And again, this is the minimum viable fast application with a few extras. So that works well. Let's go back. So basically, I'm now happy to promote this code to production. So promote to production. Click promote. What it basically does is it, it takes it makes a copy of Heroku staging and deploys it to Heroku production. And again, I just want to make sure that all is well. So I'm going to check the logs before doing anything else. Uh, we can see that, yes, looks good. Can open the application. This is a minimum viable Flask application with a few extras. Excellent. So just to kind of, why would I want to do this? Why do I set things up this way? Well, what happens is, let's say we are a development team and there are four of us and we're responsible each for a function. I am responsible for the CRUD function. My team members are responsible for the read function, another one for the update function, and the fourth one for the delete function. We're all working on separate uh, branches, our own branches. So locally, we're coding away happily. So I'm done with my uh, create function. I've tested locally. I then do a merge pull request that will then create a Heroku review application that has to be tested by one of my other team members and also approved by one of my other team members. So they test it in Heroku review, it works. They uh, approve the, the code change. That will then um, remove the Heroku review application. It will merge my development branch with the GitHub master branch that will then perform an auto deployment to Heroku staging. My colleague then is done with the read function. He or she uh, tests it locally and then uh, pushes that to their GitHub development branch called something else. And they then uh, initiate a merge pull request. Someone else on the team, maybe me, will then test that in their Roku review application, that particular function. If it works, I approve it. That person's code gets merge into the master, and then that gets pushed to the Heroku staging application. So we now have two functions. We have create and read. We can then run tests to make sure that the create and read functions work together, don't break anything. <clears throat> then my other two team members will do the same, uh, commit their code to their uh, development branches, do purge, um, merge pull requests, the Heroku review application will be created, someone else will test those to make sure they're good, approve them, their code will then be merged with GitHub master, which will be deployed to Heroku staging application. So we now have the create, read, update, and delete functions. We can now test them to full integration and system testing to make sure that everything is working as it should. And once we're happy, we can then promote that code to production. In this way, we make sure that production should potentially always be working and stable. We do the integration and system testing and staging. We do the platform unit testing then 
uh, on the Roku Review application, as well as locally on our own environments. And this is a continuous development and deployment workflow. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to get comfortable using uh, GitHub Visual Studio Code and Heroku in this manner. Could have kept it simple. Could have just used the master branch. Could have just used Heroku staging and then production. But I just wanted to make sure that uh, this, what, this would work uh, for development teams. Next, we're going to look at MongoDB with Flask and Mongo Engine and the Mongo Engine. Now, the good thing with Mongo Engine and Flask Mongo Engine is that it's hands off. So, I, all we need to do is define a URI. In other words, the um, so the link to the um, database, uh, so the MongoDB Atlas instance, the name of the database, the uh, username and password used for that. So that will create the database. We don't need to do anything. We don't need to create a database. We don't need to create the, co the collections. We don't need to add documents. It's all handled by Flask, Mongo Engine, and Mongo Engine. So the database creation, the connection and disconnection to database is handled, the creation of collections and documents. So that really means that we really can focus on our application code, our application logic, as opposed to uh, wrapping our heads around some more or around the, the, the database um, details. So what we do is we do a pip install flask dash mongo engine. That will install flask dash mongo engine, mongo engine, pymongo, and a few other extensions. I then installed DNS Python because uh, the MongoDB instance is uh, on uh, in the cloud and I needed to be able to access it using its name. So therefore I installed DNS Python. And then I define the MongoDB URI that I want to use for each environment in my .env file. And then for the, uh, the Heroku review application, the Heroku staging application, and the Heroku production application. Now I have already done that. In our code, Obviously, um, uh, we need to load uh, the Flask Mongo engine, but we then define the Mongo URI book ODM, loading it from the .eme file or the Heroku uh, environment variables, and then use that then uh, app.config to configure the settings and use an URI that we got from the environment variable. And then we instantiate the, that uh, uh, instance. Now, in .env and Heroku variables, we can see that the mongo underscore uri underscore book odm variable that I use has this value. Uh, so in my .env file, mongodb plus srv mdb, and then I have my password, uh, the name of the instance uh, out there, and then my database name. And then just the retry write, uh, write equals true, uh, write equals majority. So here I define basically everything. And that's all I need to do. Now in Heroku, obviously, I, I don't use, I don't need the, um, the, the, the double quotes. Um, I just need to define that variable. But I've called each of my instance a different name. So uh, book ODM to dev, book ODM to rev, book ODM to staging, and book ODM to production or prod. So I have four different instances. And that's all there's to it. And the good thing is this, that's all I need. I don't need to have any connect statements. I don't need to have any disconnect statements. I don't need to create the database manually. It's all done for me. So let's look, have a look at this works. We have at the bottom our MongoDB uh, NoSQL database. Normally we use PyMongo. So PyMongo is a native MongoDB driver. However, we want to use the object document mapper because to my mind, it is a better way of working with the MongoDB. Now Mongo engine, the object document mapper uses PyMongo. So it converts this code here. So collection.save or dot objects dot objects get update and delete to whatever it needs to be done uh, from a PyMongo perspective. 
but it hides all the gory details from us. Now on top of Mongo Engine, we have Flask Mongo Engine, and that handles the connection management. So for example, connection to the database, we only provide a URI. It provides a custom query set, the paginate function, as well as uh, ability to use server-side session management. So when we install Flask Mongo Engine, it also installs Mongo Engine and PyMongo. Now this means though that we can use both Mongo Engine and PyMongo Engine when we access the database. But however, there's really no need to use PyMongo uh, unless we want to do something uh, really weird and wonderful that we can't do with Mongo Engine. So looking at some of the, uh, the CRUD functions, so basically to save a collection, and I see I have a spelling mistake there, apologize, it's collection.save. Uh, to read, it's collection.objects, or for a single instance, collection.objects.get. Uh, we are going to expand on this as well later on by adding filter and order by. And then an update, usually uh, what I do is with form data, I save the form data to a dictionary, and I just point to that dictionary. So collection.update dictionary. And then collection delete uh, will delete the collection. So it's very simple. These are very simple commands. And essentially, this is all we need to know or understand or use for the basic CRUD functions, create, read, update, and delete with Mongo Engine. Now let's have a look at how we do this hands-on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a bit, but before I do that, I'm going to take that code there. I want to save it to a file that I call C1 underscore minimum viable flaw. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I will share this repository with you and you can then um, have a look at how this is built stage by stage. So what I do is this is I want to paste that into there. And now obviously that means that our .slug ignore file makes sense because I don't want to upload all the versions of my uh, C files to Heroku. I don't need to do that. I do want them though to be uploaded to the GitHub repository. So I will close that, I will close that, close that, I'm in here. Now, what we're doing now is just defining the Mongo engine configuration. And I'm just gonna paste code that I've written earlier. The only change is this, from Flask underscore Mongo engine, import Mongo engine, and this piece of code here. So loading or getting the environment variable, Mongo URI, book ODM, applying that to the application, application configuration using Mongo URI. And then my URI has the username, password, uh, the name of the database or the um, um, MongoDB Atlas environment, and then the name of the database. Then here it is instantiated. That's all that needs to be done, except for one thing, obviously. For this to work, we need to install Flask Mongo Engine and DNS Python. So that's what we're going to do next. I will do a pip install flask dash mongo engine. Now what it does is it will install mongo engine, flask mongo engine and a whole range of other things. So we have Flask VTF, so the forms, if we need them, Flask Mongo Engine, Mongo Engine, and PyMongo. So just remember, Flask Mongo Engine adds certain features, uh, such as the pagination, the connectivity, and so on, um, and session management, to Mongo Engine, which is an object document mapper, giving us the, the CRUD functions that we want to use, and that in turn uses PyMongo to connect to uh, MongoDB. Now, I also need to install 
DNS Python because uh, otherwise I can't reach the um, the MongoDB Atlas environment. There we go. What we also need to do now is update our requirements.txt file. Pip freeze requirements.txt. There we go. And to make sure that we can see that it has added DNS Python, Flask Mongo Engine, Flask VTF, Mongo Engine, PyMongo, and VT Forms. Now, I'm just going to save this. Now, this won't really do much. I just want to run it. And we should have no error messages. And that looks hopeful. Option. There we go. Same application, but just this time. Uh, we've added some of the, the database, or just the configure the database access. Okay. Um, now, what this does, though, this does not create the database. It just makes sure that we now know that my username, password, and my database name, or whatever, works as planned. What I want to do, though, is I want to save this code in another C file that I could call C2 underscore flask dash mongo engine conf and connect or con dot pi. Save that. Um, the next thing that we'd like to do then is obviously commit this. So I'm going to say flask mongo, sorry, dash mongo and configuration. So I'll then do a stage all changes, commit all, and then push. Now I could obviously do all this command line. However, I'm lazy and I like using the, <laughs> the user interface. There we go. Now I haven't merged this with my master branch because essentially I could do that, but I haven't really done very much to that uh, in word terms of changing. We'll, we'll, we'll do that uh, later on. Now, the next stage then is, let's have a look at the class. Now, when, so in Python, what we do is this, we define a class, which essentially becomes a collection. And what we do is we define a class, in this case, I call it a book, and it is instantiates the document, so db.document. What I do then is I add fields, I add field parameters, and certain meta tags. So for example, I have title, author, year, ISBN, short description, user, and so on. So these are my fields. Now, some fields I have to describe what they are, string fields, integer fields, um, whether they're fields that have dynamic documents or whatever, but or, or um, embedded documents. Now, I've kept mine quite simple, so I'm only using string fields and integer fields. What I've also done here is, in some cases, I've defined default values, as well as set certain constraints. So title has a max length of 250 characters. Author has a max length of 250 characters. A year uh, cannot be longer than four integers. ISBN cannot be longer than 13 integers. A short description, max length, 2,000 characters, and so on. I've also... As some Tagesa said that some of the fields need to be required or, or uh, need to be required. In other words, a username. What I've also done here is added a creation date for uh, so when another when a book is added to the database or document, it will have the creation date that I can then use for statistics. How many books were added by this user during this month, for example. Another interesting thing I'd like you to look at is if you see rating. So I provide a rating of a book from one to 10. And what I'm telling it here is it can only have the choice. So using choices of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. 
The other thing I'd like to highlight are these meta tags. So what I'm telling the, uh, this tells MongoDB or actually Mongo engine that I want to create an, an auto index. So the object ID is automatically created. Now that is on by default. So this, this for me is what I call a paranoia setting. This is just me making sure that really does that. What I'm also saying here, index background is, let's say we're adding uh, a thousand documents at one go. What will happen is MongoDB will take the time to add those documents and index them before giving back control to my application. However, what I'm saying is add those documents, but give me immediate control back to my application and index those documents in the background. So that's a good performance. Uh, this is good to do you know, in real life. What I'm also saying is by default, we have the object ID as an index. I'm just adding an additional index a title. I could also add, let's say, comma author or whatever. And I'm also saying that regardless of the order of my books in the database, I want them ordered by title when working with them. So that means that if I do just a simple, uh, let's say book dot objects, in order to get all the, the book documents from the database, they will be provided in alphabetical order because of ordering title. I don't need to add dot order by. So that's just an ex some extra things that have been quite useful uh, to know and to use. I will say though, that for this example, I will use um, all these fields or I will use this example, but I won't use all the fields uh, when we create the application because they're not needed for what it is we want to do. Now, what happens is, and again, I'm going to go to there, I'm going to copy that, create a new file, or the C3. The reason I'm doing this is that you can easily follow along step by step to see, you know, what we do first with a minimal viable application, what do we add later on for the Fask Mongo engine, what do we add later on for now right now for the class. So I'm just going to call it book. class collection.py. Uh, no, sorry. I already, yeah, okay. So let's, let's create that anyway. Oh, that's not what I want to do. Have I, okay, I already created that. Sorry, I'm just confusing myself. Don't worry. Happens often. So here, I'm going to paste, do a control A and V. I'll do that there as well. Just add that code there, save that, close that. Now, looking at app.py, the two main changes. I've updated the route and I've added the, uh, so added the class. What I've also done here in this piece of code is I've inputted date time. Why? Because I'm using date time here. So when a new book is added, I want to know the creation date and time. Um, I've also uh, cheated a bit just using for, from Flask, importing Flask, render template, in other words, render the HTML template we're going to use, uh, redirect for redirecting URLs, creating URLs, URL4, uh, requests, um, and then flash messages as well as session. And we're going to use session later on, but I'm just loading them all here in, uh, in one go, okay? Now, I've already covered the class, but here it is. Um, and essentially what it is, class, a name, book, can be whatever you want to do. And I'm using, you can see there when I hover where it says DB Mongo Engine. So I'm using Mongo Engine dot document. And that document then, I am providing a number of fields. I am explaining what those fields are by DB dot string field or DB dot in field. And there are a number of other fields that can be defined. Um, I provide a default value. I've set certain constraints, some max length and so on. And then with a meta tag, I just want to make sure that it creates an automatic index, which it does anyway, but I just want to be sure. I want to make sure that everything is indexed in the background. I want that beyond the object ID. I want 
my title to be an index to speed up searches and so on using the title and also I want to make sure that regardless of the order of my books in the database I want that when I uh, do a search um, from the database I want my books ordered by title what I've also done I'm going to look at a little greater detail uh, a little later but I've added my or expanded the initial route so it means that they can use anybody accessing this can use the default you know the, just the name of the site or slash index or slash index.html that's again me being a bit paranoid I defined my home page function and what I do here and this is the first thing um, I execute books.object so that essentially I'm telling Mongo engine to get all my book objects if there are any in my database and save them to books underscore pagination and what I've done here as well I just want to print the number of books now initially the database is empty so it should have zero I will load a sample set and we will see that it will change and then rendering that template so using render template here to render my index HTML file providing it with the books that I've just uh, read from the database but to do this though we require a, a few additional files so what I'm going to do is um, I am going to <laughs> copy my statics folder that I already have uh, because I want to save time so my static folder has images that I use logo background it has certain scripts such as the timeout of the flash messages and the instantiation of the materialize 1.0.0 functions that I use but I won't go through that in greater detail and then also my style.css file so I'm just making life a little easy for myself 